And within its lifetime, it had had 10 owners. 10, 10! Hello guys, welcome back to Car Obsession and welcome to a rather windy day in Worthing. Hopefully you can hear me okay. As you can see, I'm joined by my Mark II Sets Land Cupra and in this video, I'm going to be speaking about why I bought this very car. So let's get out of the wind and into the car. So then, why did I buy a Mark II Sets Land Cupra? This is a car that you probably weren't expecting and in all honesty, I wasn't expecting to be um, driving this car right here, right now. Um, now, this very car was saved on my Auto Trader um, shortlist for a very long time, but it's one of those ones that every time I looked at it, it didn't really fill me with any excitement. Um, and Patsy even said, that car looks boring. And I kind of agreed with her. So although it sat in my shorts list for a long time, it was never really a car I would say I had strong intentions of buying. So, the, so that begs the question, what led me to buy this car? Well, I wanted a five-door hot hatchback that was turbocharged. My budget was around 7,000 pounds, which is a pretty generous budget, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, but the the age of hot hatchbacks I was looking at, not many of them were made available in a five door. Um, so my choice of cars was relatively limited to begin with. Now I will speak about my other options in a bit, um, but I don't want to I, I, I don't want to take too much focus away from the Leon. So why did I buy this car? Well, for starters, it had a very good service history. This has a uh, main Seat dealer history throughout the course of its life. And yes, okay, one could argue a car doesn't have to have main dealer history, but it, it kind of indicates that, that the previous owners um, have been willing to spend that extra bit of money to, to, to look after their car. And that can only be a good thing, right? Uh, so it had main dealer history. Um, the, the, um, the dealer I bought the car from, he had very good reviews. He was very helpful, uh, very friendly. And yes, he, he offered a good service. So that was another reason. So very good service history. Dealer had good reviews. This car is a five door. So that was, um, that was really one of our, our biggest bits of criteria for replacing the Civic Type R. Um, and this is also turbocharged, which again was quite, uh, this was pretty much a, a prerequisite for the replacement of the Type R. I, I really wanted a, to own a turbocharged car again because long term subscribers may remember that I had the uh, Seat Ibiza FR. And yes, I did kind of fall out of love with it, but I never got bored of its turbocharged power delivery. And that is another reason why I chose this car. Because I've owned a Seat before and they've been reliable. I like Seat as a brand because you're essentially getting a sportier Volkswagen for less money. Yes, the interior isn't quite as nice, but I'm not that fussed about that in all honesty. This car has got pretty good miles on it. So when I bought it, it had about um, 83,476 miles precisely. Um, so pretty good mileage for the age. This car before me only had two former keepers. The last of which owned the car for 11 years. Um, so yeah, that is that was another thing I wanted. I wanted a car with as little owners as possible. So that was another big tick. And this car's got a pretty good level of equipment. So I've got dual zone climate control, cruise control, bi on headlamps, 18 inch alloys, sportier styling, and these fantastic sports seats. So this car's got a pretty good list of equipment. Bearing in mind, this is a 13 year old car. 
And let's speak about the condition of the car as well. The interior is wonderful. Those rear seats look like they've never been used. So the interior is in very good condition. The bolsters still feel firm. They're not sagging. And it's, the inside is, yeah, in very impressive condition. The outside condition is also pretty good as well. Yes, of course, there are a few age-related marks, a few scratches here and there, but nothing really major. And when you look at the car, it does look pretty good. I wouldn't say the car looks mint, but it is in very good condition. And it's also wearing good tires as well. Um, and that may seem really what, picky, and you may think, well, why is it picking up the tires? That's a bit random. But on the front axle, I've got Goodyear Eagle F1s, very good tyres. And on the rear axle, I've got um, uh, Pirelli P's, P0 Nero's, I think. I'm not, not overly sure of the uh, brand of the, the rear tyres, but there are Pirelli's on the back. Um, so again, a good choice of tyre. And overall, the car just looked like a really tidy example. Oh, Vauxhall VX220. Wow, you don't see those every day. So there's a lot of things that went, went in favour of this car. And I will be honest, when I test drove it, I didn't really feel much emotion. It didn't really, it didn't really spark up a fire in my soul. Now, I know that sounds really um, wishy-washy and a bit sappy, but I, there wasn't much emotion when I first drove it. And I, I will be honest, when I kind of put the, the, the deposit down, I did think, have I made the right choice? And the reason why I was quite, well, quite happy to put the deposit down was because this car, it just made a lot of sense for, for what I wanted and what I needed. Although my heart wasn't went over, my head was. I think this is the first car I've bought in a long time where I've used my head more than my heart. Now, thankfully, the, the more I've driven the Leon, the more it has uh, wormed its way into, into my heart. I'm not going to say I love it just yet. I think that would be premature. But I'm, I'm certainly growing a fondness for the car. And it does make me smile, which is always a good thing. So that's really why I bought this car. It just made sense and it ticked quite a lot of my boxes. Not necessarily the car I thought I would buy. And to be honest, I never really considered a, a Mark II Leon Cooper that much because I'm not a massive fan of how this car looks. But I kind of had to look past that and think, well, on paper, out of everything I've looked at, this is the most sensible choice. But it's not to say that this car's boring, far from it. And there are exciting things coming your way and the car's way, so I will get it remapped, I will get a different exhaust put on, I will uh, put it on lowering springs and maybe do a few other bits as well. I'd like to save up for um, uh, a limited slip diff as well, but that I have to uh, wait a little bit. Um, so that's, that's why I bought this car. Now, what were my other options? So, there weren't a lot of options to hand because I wanted something turbocharged and I wanted something with, with five doors, and I wanted a hot hatchback. I did toy about with buying a fast estate car, but I thought, I don't know, estate cars aren't really me. Um, I thought, no, you know, hot hatchbacks, is, that genre of car is, is kind of in my blood. Um, so I thought, no, I don't really want to stray away from that type of car. So I was looking at a, a Mark I, Leon Cooper R, and I really like the, the Mark I set Leon Cooper R because it's, I love the, the, the design, it's boxy, muscular, brutish, it just looks aggressive, it, it, if, if that car were a person, it would threaten to punch your lights out if you spilt its point, whereas this, this is a very different design, it's, it's adventurous, but it's quite curvaceous, isn't it? It's not overly aggressive, whereas the Mark I, yeah, that's a car that looks like it means business, whereas this, 
dare I say this almost looks a little bit ashamed of being a hot hatch don't know. oh look there's a, a, a mark um, there's a mark one set lounge Cooper there don't think that's a Cooper I think that's just uh, the Cooper um, yeah the reason why I chose in the end not to go down the, the road of a mark one lounge Cooper or Cooper R was purely the age now of course any used car can I have problems this one has had a few problems actually which I will speak about in a separate video um, but I thought well the, the Leon Cooper R I was looking at was 17 years old and yes you can get slightly younger ones but even the the youngest one would have been 15 years old and I know this is 13 years old so we're speaking only a few years but this is on a newer platform this this shares the same platform as a mark 5 golf gti uh, whereas the mark 1 leon cupra slash cupra r that shares its platform with the mark 4 golf gti so an older platform i thought well if it's an older car it may have more age related problems not that the the mark 1 is unreliable but i just thought uh, do i really want to be getting a car that's like potentially 17 years old not really no um so sadly i took the the mark one lounge cupra r off the table which is a shame because i um i really like that car uh of course i could have looked at a mark 5 golf gti as i've mentioned a few moments ago this car was was based on a mark 5 golf gti but in my eyes is a bit predictable it is a bit of a safe option i wanted to be a little bit more adventurous in my decision and yes i'm i'm, I'm fully aware that this car is based on a mark 5 golf gti so what i've essentially done is gone i'm not going to buy a mark a mark, a mark 5 golf gti but i'm going to buy a car that's based on a mark 5 golf gti it kind of doesn't make sense but hopefully you, un you understand my logic this is sportier and more powerful there were a lot of mark 5s on the market which um would have been pretty decent and i did look at the edition 30 so there was a special edition of the golf gti to mark 30 years of the gti and it was called the edition 30 so it actually had the same turbocharger as this car although it wasn't quite as powerful it had 230 horsepower and not 240 uh, which is what this has um, and I quite like the Edition 30. It's got a nice interior. Um, it's it's more collectible, of course, because it's it is a special edition. Uh, and there were a few on the market for my budget, but they were either too far away, um, or actually, to be fair, a lot of them were quite high in mileage. If I wanted a tidy one, well, not a tidy one. If I wanted one with less miles, then I would have needed to have, have paid more money. So I did look at a few, a few edition 30s, but ultimately uh, I couldn't find one that was right in budget. So that was the Golf GTI out of the way. Uh, I didn't really consider a Skoda Octavia VRS. Uh, got nothing against them and uh, fellow YouTuber and friend of the channel, Chris Dreams to Drive, he has uh, a Mark One Octavia VRS nicknamed Otto. And I've had a passenger ride in that car, and yeah, that car is pretty punchy. Um, don't get me wrong, it's a good car, but I just, sorry Chris if you're watching, but I just find the Octavia VRS just a bit boring. Sorry. And of course, that leads me on to the Mark II Ford Focus ST. Look, I'm, I'm even grinning as I say it. Uh, the, the Mark II Ford Focus ST is a car that I've wanted to own for quite some time. Um, but they can be quite troublesome. They do have quite a few common problems. Um, now that car was built as a five door as well as a three door. But would you like to hazard a guess how many five door examples there were on Auto Trader in my budget for the whole of the UK? Not just like within a, oh, Mark 8 Fiesta ST, not just within 100 miles of where I live or that kind of thing, I mean the, the whole of the UK, how many five door Focus STs do you think there were? I'll give you a few moments. You can talk amongst yourselves. Right, so if you said around 25, you'd be correct. <laughs> so I couldn't believe how, how limited 
the choice of five doors were. Uh, if you wanted a three door, well, you're, you're almost tripping over them. Uh, but obviously the five doors were less less desirable. Um, and out of that 25, or it's around 25, like, like I said a few moments ago, out of those 25s, trying to find a good example was quite difficult. Um, because I came across a lot of Focus STs and the amount of owners they had had was crazy. I actually came across, uh, I won't go that way, I actually came across one Focus ST, I think it was like 10 years old, um, no, so it wasn't, it wasn't 10 years old, so I'm, I'm talking rubbish, it was about uh, about 13 years old, give or take, so similar kind of age to this, and within its lifetime, it had had 10 owners, 10, 10, um, and that wasn't exactly uncommon, a, a lot of used Focus STs on the market, they seem to change hands, uh, they, they seem to change hands more often than the village bike. Um, I did come across one Focus ST, a blue one, and I really wanted a blue one. Um, and I really thought it was the one. It was a good price. It was a pre-facelift, which is what I prefer because I, I think the facelift doesn't look aggressive enough for my liking. So yes, so a, a blue Focus ST, good mileage, good amount of former keepers. Um, the dealership had amazing reviews and on photos, it looked really, really good. The condition looked to be uh, of quite a high standard. So I thought, ah, oh, this has got, got to be the one. So I rang up the dealer. This was when the lockdown was a bit more stricter and I arranged a video phone call to be shown around the car. And I'm glad that I did that because when I looked at the car, pretty much every panel had some kind of blemish or scratch or, or dent. Um, the tyres were quite badly uh, curbed. Did I say the tyres? Sorry, the alloys. I don't know if I said alloys or tyres, but the alloys were, were badly curbed. Um, and there were a few things that concerned me. Um, first of which was the rear axle had continental tyres, which is good. Whereas the front axle, the driven axle, had um, ditch finders. Um, and a few people said to me when I, when I told them about this, they said, well, maybe they just put cheap tyres on the car to sell it. And yeah, okay, I can see why someone would do that. But for a Focus ST or, or a hot hatchback, surely you'd kind of spend a bit more money. Would you not? Um, it, it is a performance car. Um, it's a five-cylinder um, powered car. Why not put some decent tyres on it, even if you're going to, going to sell it? Uh, because for someone like me, if I see a car that's got cheap tyres, that, that does kind of put me off. And that was, an, that was another thing with the Focus STs. A lot of them had ditch finders on them. I thought, well, if, like, if the owners can't be prepared to, to put money into good tyres, then that doesn't bode well for the rest of the car. Um, so I got the dealer to go through the service book. And bearing in mind that the last owner had owned it for about four years, within their ownership, the service book, uh, the, the service book hadn't been stamped once. I thought, okay, so they've owned, they've owned that car for four years, and on the evidence I've been presented, they've never had it serviced. And at that point, I thought, no, this is not the car for me. Um, so that was that was actually quite gutting because I, I honestly thought. That's my next car, but it wasn't to be. Uh, I would show you the car, but it's, it has since been sold. Uh, this was quite a few weeks ago um, that um, I looked at the car. There was another Focus ST, which I thought was the one. I think it still might be for sale. Um, so it was um, an ST500, which is the special edition. So it was finished in, uh, I think it was Panther, Panth no, was it Onyx Black or Panther Black? Oh, I can't remember now. But anyway, it was fi finished in black with red leather interior. Car Obsession colours, black and red. And not, not only was it Car Obsession themed, but this one had been modified to a very high standard. Yes, okay, certain parts of the styling did look a little bit Halford, but it was ready to go. It was, it was Revo-tuned. It, it had all the modifications. So really, I wouldn't need to do anything with it. And I think it had a tracker as well, which is quite good. 
Uh, it was in budget. Okay, it was it was the upper end of my budget, but I thought, well, I won't need any money left over for modifications because it's been modified to the level that I would have wanted. So I contacted the dealer um, and I said, okay, how many owners uh, has it had? Oh, I've had seven. Seven, okay. Not, not the end of the world, but seven uh, former owners isn't fantastic. I said, oh, do you know when, when the cam belt was last done? Uh, no, we haven't got a record of that. Right, okay, so it could potentially need uh, a cam belt. Uh, and I said, uh, do you know if the block mod has been done? No, we don't. Right, okay, so you've got a car that's been tuned to that level. I think it was pushing out 300 horsepower and there's no evidence of a block mod. Mm, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Now, for those of you that are wondering, what's a block mod? Basically, I won't go into go. I won't go into it too much because I don't want to bore you to tears. But a block mod is something that is advisable to do on a Mark II Focus ST, as it is a, a preventative measure to stop the cylinder liners cracking, and that is something you definitely want to do if you're going to remap the car. Uh, it's quite an expensive job to do. You're looking at around seven to eight hundred pounds, depending on where you go. Um, and basically, they, basically, they put a. Uh, uh, metal shims between the cylinder liners and they also do the timing belt change or the cam belt change and replace the water pump at the same time because they have to be removed to do, to do the job so it makes sense to replace them whilst you're there and that's why the job is around seven or eight hundred pounds so yeah you don't have to do it if you mod, if you remap a focus st uh, but it is very advisable um, because you don't want the cylinder liners cracking because if that if that happens um, it's yeah you have to get a new engine so and that's not cheap um, and also when you remap a Mark II Focus ST there's a good chance you will need to upgrade the clutch because the standard clutch uh, will often slip when you put more power through the car so you, uh, it was um, one of the popular modifications to do is to fit the clutch from the Focus RS so it's it's stronger and you can put more power through it now, if you, if you were to do that, if you were to put the RS clutch in and do the block mod on, on a Mark II Focus ST, roughly, roughly speaking, you're looking at about 1,500 quid. And that's one, of, that's one of the reasons why I was put off by the Focus ST, because before I can do any tuning, I'm looking at a 1,500 quid bill to get the car ready for a remap. Now, of course, uh, that bill could be lower it could be more and that's a rough price so before focus st owners attack me in the comments that is not uh that's not an, an accurate price that's just a rough price that's an estimate really um, more of a guess um so yeah so finding a good focus st w was difficult um because it i it, it either wasn't in good enough condition it was too far away it had too many former keepers um yeah trying to find one that was that was right was almost impossible to be honest so i think that's really everything i have to say on the leon cooper well in this video at least uh, i know this has probably been a long video but i wanted to really explain my journey to this car and i i spent a long time looking for cars therefore there, there's quite a lot of detail and context uh, to go into my story but I do hope you have enjoyed this video, that you, that you found it interesting. Um, if you have, please, of course, as always, uh, like, comment and subscribe. If you are subscribed, don't forget to, to click the bell icon so you get notified every time I make a video. But until the next time, guys, be sure to keep up the car obsession. Oh, and check out the merch.